as I said, this talk is called Effective and Empathetic Code Reviews. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I work on all things JS, so it's very small. You haven't heard of us. Uh, machine learning startup called Instabase. We're hiring San Francisco, New York, remote. Talk to me after if you're interested. Um, before that, I worked at Code Academy and Major League Baseball Advanced Media for big chunks of time. Here's a picture of me at the Canadian National Potato Museum. Um, I care a lot about nice and empathetic engineering organizations. That probably means a lot of different things to different people, but in my career, that has really looked like me caring a lot about soft skills, uh, standards, engineering values, communication, more so than things like tooling or like even code sometimes. And uh, this is my first talk. Thanks so much for having me here. All right. So what is a code review? What are we talking about here? Uh, just a quick definition of terms. Code reviews are the process in which another member of an engineering team, not the author of the code, reviews and approves new changes before they can be added to a code base. Um, in most organizations, this is mandatory, barring extenuating circumstances, before code can be merged and kind of end, end up in master. Most commonly, in my experience, this happens in GitHub via a pull request, which I'll also be calling PRs, but that's not, that's not uh, true about everywhere, but I think most people have experienced this in GitHub. <laughs> and why do we do this? What is the point of a code review? I'd say at its most basic, the point is a quality control step. You're asking someone else to check your work and confirm things like, does the code I wrote actually work? Uh, are we handling edge cases? Do, does this conform to how our team typically writes code? And then I would say as you get more senior in your career and your features become more complex, your code reviews become a conversation around the engineering decisions you made. So does the way I solve this problem make sense to someone else's eyes? Um, is this the right way to set up a component? Is this the right way to abstract a concept? And so I really like to think of this as like, it's something that exists in my brain when we put sunlight on it, does it make sense to other people? Um, I think it's a very useful tool for having conversations in public and on the record where other people can see them, other people can learn from them and contribute, rather than you asking someone why you did something in Slack or in person, and that knowledge never gets shared out and distributed to the rest of the team. And most importantly to me, code review is an opportunity to transfer knowledge to the team and to teach each other. Um, apart from maybe pair programming, I think reading pull requests and providing feedback is one of the fastest ways to get integrated onto a team, understand your code base, and coalesce around a house style for how your team wants to write code. Um, but how can it go bad? This is not a comprehensive list, but these are some more common archetypes that I have seen in my career. So we'll go through them quickly. Uh, lazy authors, those are people who hand off the code for code review even before it's been double checked. They, hasn't, they haven't sufficiently like, documented everything, or worse, the code might not even work before they ask people to review it. Uh, maximalist authors, those are the authors who do too many things in a pull request. I wrote a new component, and I under, updated an underlying utility function, plus everywhere it's used, and I changed the name of a bunch of variables, all, and maybe I threw in like a new ESLint rule while I was at it, too many things at once. And the flip for reviewers, uh, strict reviewers, so those are like the people I think can't see the forest for the trees, and they spend a lot of time parsing every variable name you've done and every method implementation you've written. Uh, slow reviewers, those are people who block the pipeline by failing to prioritize code reviews over their own work. And uninformed reviewers, so people who agree to review but don't take the time to sufficiently understand what's happening with what you've done. Uh, I would say beware of a green check that comes too quickly or comes too easily on your features. All right, so what can we do about it? Um, I'll go through authors and reviewers and discuss some helpful frames of mind for you that you can have to evolve beyond some of the pitfalls we've talked about. Um, this is a good point for me to put in a disclaimer about myself. All this advice is based on my experience in the tech industry. I'm a white guy, I've been fairly successful in my career, and so that makes me prone to advising things like pushing back against other reviewers or speaking up when you don't understand things. I hope this advice is helpful, but I do understand that it's not something that can be taken by everybody in every situation. It does come from a place of privilege. All right, so I wanna talk about prerequisites before we even talk about authors and reviewers. Um, step zero to everything in your code base, I think, should be to automate and extract away a lot of sharp edges. Um, it may be a pain to set up some of these tools, but they really are crucial to the long-term health of a code base. So first bullet, formatting and linting. Uh, the most common tools for these in the JS world are Prettier and ESLint. I truly cannot sing the praises highly enough of these two tools. They're run in conjunction to automatically format any changed files or staged files. I would even suggest 
blocking your dev pipeline at some point, maybe blocking commit or blocking merge into master if there are ESLint errors that couldn't be automatically fixed. Um, so you, this, uh, da, da, da. yeah, so there could be larger conversations about like the rules you want as a team, what does our prettier formatting look like, what are our ESLint rules, but we move those out of individual pull requests of people going back and forth saying, I don't like trailing commas here, to this kind of larger house style focused conversation and allow people to ship their individual codes and the individual features. Um, and then moving on to that, the engineering style guide. Some things don't fall as easily into an ESLint or a prettier world, and this can live into an, in an engineering style guide. Things like, what do we name our functions? How do we organize our components? What does our CSS look like? This is probably a living and maybe even contentious document, but again, it moves micro conversations on a pull request into macro conversations into a different location. Um, Static typing tools, tools like Flow or TypeScript, head off a lot of conversations that could happen later on a PR level, like what is the shape of an object you expect to get passed into a function? What happens if something is null? Those were kind of like keep you honest about those things so someone doesn't have to ask about it later. Uh, just general standards around testing so that you know when you should be writing unit or integration tests. Tools like Code Climate can prevent merge if your testing coverage percentage like drops below a certain threshold. Things like that will keep devs sort of honest to make sure that they are writing unit tests. And I like to think of unit tests as documentation for your reviewers. Here's what I expect stuff to do, and I'm so confident about that. I committed it into our code. And uh, pull request templates, they remove a lot of the guesswork from developers on your team as to like what we expect when we're submitting a pull request to someone, how do we test it? What's the ticket number? Are there screenshots? What does it actually do? All of that is really helpful and can change from person to person. So if you template it away, it makes your life a lot easier. All right, so let's talk about authors of the code. So as an author, I think your goal is to reduce the friction between your code and the reviewer. You want as few obstacles as possible for someone else to understand what you wrote. The first bullet is keep the focus narrow. If at all possible, keep the focus of your pull request very narrow to have it do one thing. I'm a big proponent of stack pull requests. You can Google that term, you'll find a blog post in 2016 by Grayson Koontz. But basically the idea is that if you have a large feature, you'll break it up into a series of smaller pull requests that branch off of each other so that you can submit it to a team to be like, hey, here's this huge feature that I wrote, but you can look at it bite by bite and kind of understand the evolution of it. It really prevents you submitting this huge PR that's 30 change files and someone just says, okay, it looks good, it's fine. It, ha it has too much complexity for them to be able to understand it, so if you break it up, it makes it a lot easier for people to review. Um, for example, with me right now, I'm working on this really gnarly code base that hasn't received a lot of love lately, so my process will look like I'll branch off of master into a new pull request, I'll do all of my linting and formatting, because it's really noisy in a pull. I'll branch off of that, I'll do maybe the presentational visual layer styles, a new component, but no, no actual like data fetching, things like that. Branch off of that, we do API calls, function stuff, helper functions, things like that. One more branch for integration tests, and you know, maybe branches into infinity of like other abstractions or decisions they made that I didn't like. And then from there, people can review these bit by bit. They all get merged into one omnibus feature branch, which would be impossibly, impossible to review by a single person at once, and then we merge all that into master. Um, I sort of think like the macro point here is you should be able to answer the question, what one thing does my pull request do? Occasionally the footprint of that will be large. I changed an ESLint rule and I had to update it in 200 files. I create a new component with all of its styles and all of its JS, but again, try to keep it scoped to what is one thing that this does. Okay, the first reviewer should be you. This is one of those that I think seems obvious, but people forget about it occasionally. Uh, after you create a pull request, Scroll through the file diff and uh, confirm that everything that's in there you want someone else to look at. Have you deleted all your comments that are like, fix me? Have you deleted stuff that you didn't actually use? Make sure to take the time to treat the code as if it's not yours before you ask someone else to do that for you. Okay, provide relevant context. Um, after you hand off a pull, uh, pull request to someone else, remember that as the author, you have the most context. You spent a lot of time in the code, you understand it inside and out, you know all, why you made all these certain decisions, and right now, that only lives in your head. Uh, make sure to dump 
all of that context out for people. A pull request is a living document even after the code has been merged and it goes into master. So many times I have been in a code base, I've seen a weird decision, say I don't know why we did that, you get blame, traces you back to a pull request in GitHub, and that has some context and some explanation as to like, oh, this was a problem I was solving, I had to solve it in this way, it's great. So this relevant context can often look like descriptive pull requests, or pull requ like descriptive descriptions in the PR, the business why, the coding why, the what, the long-term plans, uh, inline PR comments about the specific choices you made, code comments, unit tests, lots of context like that. Okay, respond to all actionable feedback. Uh, remember that your colleagues are taking a lot of time out of their schedules to sit with your code, and it's your responsibility to reciprocate that on their feedback. As people ask questions, it's incumbent on you to respond to each of them. You don't have to do everything your colleagues are asking. In fact, sometimes in the spirit of keeping the focus narrow, I think it's better to be like, thanks for noticing that, I didn't change that, but I will follow up with that on a pull request later, or I'll make an issue to it. But again, you, do, you should respond to all the people on your team. Um, I think it's fine to go offline with these conversations if you feel like you're going back and forth or you don't quite understand something. Just split off with someone on Slack or in person, but make sure you come back to the poll and be like, the reviewer meant this, we talked about it offline, I'm going to change ABC as a result. Again, the PR is your living document, it is the document of record. And sort of the summation for authors, I would say, try to write trustworthy code, and people on your team will begin to give you the benefit of the doubt. Trustworthy code could mean lots of things. To me, it means uh, manageable, focused, narrow PRs, the code works, it's tested, it's descriptive, and you've kind of gone through and proactively found the weird parts, and you have documented like, hey, I know this looks weird, I did this for this reason. Okay, so let's pivot to reviewers. I think this area is much more fraught, uh, a lot more prone to bullying, intellectual superiority from other people, ill feelings, all sorts of stuff, a lot of bad behavior. So my first piece is in the, the title of the talk, is to come, from the, come to this from a place of empathy. Um, before you review code, I would suggest that you align your mental compass toward empathy and a common goal. Assume that the author knows what they are doing. Assume they understand the relevant issues and assume that every line is not busted. This might not be true. In my experience, it's often not true, but I would say start there. Start that you, this is like a coworker and someone on your same team rather than the other way around. Um, and I would suggest you also try to understand how the code fits into the larger system and business, not if it is identical to what you would have done. Try to see the forest for the trees, if at all possible. Okay, next, read twice, comment once. I think your first role as a reviewer when you have a pull request is to simply read all of it and don't touch your keyboard. Try to understand the decisions the author made, understand the common patterns or duplications that there are, understand the architecture choices they made. This helps you in a couple ways. So one, it's possible that the entire PR that you have been sent is a total non-starter. Maybe the foundational assumptions or the decisions they made are wrong or wouldn't work at scale. If you go through and sort of comment on all of the micro problems, but then conclude at the end, oh, hey, by the way, we have to rethink the whole approach, you have failed as a reviewer. Uh, you, first assess to need, you first need to assess if the author should go back to the drawing board and then maybe take that conversation offline, take it to pair programming with you before you kind of go get into the nitty gritty. Um, reading through it first also allows you to see patterns in the code. Um, I would really highly suggest people avoid commenting on the same issue more than once, more than twice, to really avoid that deluge of comments that's like, fix this, and here, and here, also here, also here. If you get that in your inbox, or you see that as an author, it really makes you feel like garbage. There's this whole deluge of comments. So bundle that all together into one large summary comment. I noticed in a couple places you did this pattern. Let's go back and rethink that. Okay. As a reviewer, know your limitations. Um, so uh, you know, understand that are you a junior developer, are you a person without sufficient experience or context? Say so. You don't have to give a green check mark just because you were asked to. It's totally in your power to say, I read over this, I don't really understand it, I don't have enough knowledge to constantly give approval. I think we need to either sit down and I need to understand it better or you should ask someone else to review it. I think that's totally fine. Um, as you're going through code, ask questions and use we statements. Uh, remember, we're all approaching, approaching this from a place that the author has all the context and they have thought of the possible edge cases. Perhaps they didn't, but still, frame things like, for my own knowledge, why did you do this, instead of you should have done something else. 
Maybe they should have, but again, it's your job as the reviewer to help lead the authors to a certain place, not to dictate it for them. And in general, understand that the code is a shared responsibility of the whole team. So phrase things as like, uh, phrase things as we, not the way you did this makes this impossible, but would we still be able to do X as a result of the way you have written the code? Uh, a review is not you versus the author. It is a culmination of our work as a team on our code. Okay, no nits. This is my favorite slide. This is perhaps my most controversial stance. Um, reviewers will often flag things as nits that they think are possibly small or trivial, but they still want you to change them. Uh, if you find yourself doing this a lot as a reviewer, I really encourage you to introspect and ask like, why do you think this is a nit? Uh, do you think it's because they wrote in a different style and you think they should change it? If that's the case, you probably shouldn't mention it. Do you think it's a pattern that we as a team should be employing more? Then your problem is with a style guide or ESLint or, or a prettier config, not this specific PR. And do you think what you're asking for is actually necessary? Then it's not a nit. Don't, don't classify it as a nit. Don't make it, don't sort of trivialize your comment. Um, I think people most commonly come to nits because they see something that they personally wouldn't have done. But in general, uh, if you wanted all the code in your code base to look like you wrote it, you shouldn't be working on a team. <laughs> and I feel so strongly about this, I put it on its own slide. Uh, if you want all the code to look like you wrote it, you shouldn't be working on a team. Um, and it's like changing variable names or the organization of functions. They slow down reviewers, they dishearten the authors of the code, and they harm your reputation as a reviewer. And so I would really encourage you to interrogate why you want small and nitpicky things changed and the consequences it can have on authors and on your team. Okay, my last slide for reviewers is to show gratitude for the author of the code. Uh, this is a very new one to me, modified or modeled by an incredible developer that I worked with at Code Academy named Mike Boyle. Um, at the end of a review, he would like take all this gratitude to the author for having written the code. He would thank them. He said, "Oh, you did such a wonderful job. I really appreciate all the work you've done." And it was really amazing. It's such a concept. I've never seen anyone be so nice in a professional setting. Um, I think at the most transactional level, if someone wrote code, that means you don't have to write the code. Uh oh, it's pretty spooky, okay. Um, so if someone else wrote it, you don't have to write it, and I think that is genuinely worth gratitude. He also made sure to thank thoroughness, to thank documentation, thank cleanliness, all the things that we discussed in the four authors section. Okay. Um, and I have a, a couple of bonus slides on the role of managers. Managers cannot review all of the, uh, can't monitor all the code reviews, but you should know what is happening on your team. So this is just keep the finger on the pulse. Try to understand the personas of your team. Uh, are there people who are always submitting things that are half-baked? Have conversations with them. Make sure that they understand the consequences they have in the team. Are there jerks? Uh, get them off of code reviews or maybe take more drastic measures. Uh, fire them. And yeah, I would say in general, cultivating culture is an active process, and it is actively done by a manager. So keep that in mind. And also, praise in public, criticize in private. This is a phrase a friend said to me. I think she ripped it off from Radical Candor, but I haven't read it yet, so I don't know. Um, as a manager, make sure to give lots of public praise. Call out good reviews when you see them. I think it's both important to be nice to people on your team, but also very important to give junior and less experienced developers on your team behavior to model. Um, and also ensure that the norms are followed, and when they're not followed, act quickly in private to let people know that they deviated from expectations. Okay, so we'll do a brief recap. All right, for authors, um, keep the focus narrow. First reviewer is you. Provide relevant context. Respond to all actionable feedback and write trustworthy code. For reviewers, come from a place of empathy. Read twice, comment once. Know your limitations. Ask questions and use we statements. No nits. Uh, and show gratitude and humility. And for managers, keep your finger on the pulse and praise in public, criticize in private. All right, so I would say code reviews are one of the most powerful tools we have as an engineering organization. There's no better way to teach best practices, coalesce on a style, share knowledge. Make sure you use this tool carefully. You'll see significant results. Um, I want to specifically call out an article that everybody should Google called Unlearning Toxic Behaviors in Code Review Culture by uh, Sandhya Sankaram. It's from 2015, but I read this years ago and it really coalesced in my brain a lot of these toxic behaviors that I was seeing and sort of is one of the seeds for this whole conversation. It's one of those great articles that sticks in your brain forever and never goes away. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thanks so much. Yeah.